Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Into the Odd Remastered. So this is a sponsored Kickstarter preview for a book that is in crowdfunding right now. Link will be right down there in the description below for you to check it out for yourself. Uh, Chris McDowell asked me to do this video and I was very happy to do it uh, because I am a huge fan of Into the Odd. Uh, it's been an inspirational book for me going back years and years. It was a big influence on my development for Maze Rats. So I'm very excited to see this new revised and expanded version. All right, let's jump into it and see what we get in this new version of Into the Odd. So this is a, a mostly complete PDF version. Chris said that it, there may be some more revisions, a little bit more uh, tweaking and polishing, but it is broadly done. So this should give us a very good sense of what we're going to get if we go for the Kickstarter. Uh, great new artwork uh, design on the front by Johan Knorr. Uh, Johan was one of the designers behind Morkborg. So this whole new project is like a combination of Into the Odd and Morkborg. Uh, one interesting thing though that we will see as we go through this is that the uh, design sensibilities that we saw in Morkborg, which were a little bit over the top for some people, I think have been toned down and made far more useful here, where we get a lot of the really great art and design sensibilities while increasing the uh, readability and usability of the text. Let's see what we get here. So we have some of these beautiful marbled end papers. Let me switch this so that it is two panels. So we can see what the two page spreads look like into the odd remastered it's being put out by free league publishing in collaboration with Chris McDowell's bastion land press. And we've got our table of contents here. So this thing is well over hundred pages, um, well over 110, the original into the odd, if I look at it right here was about mm, 42 pages long or so. So this thing is about triple the size. A lot of that I believe is a heavily expanded, uh, starting adventure, which is really nice. Uh, the art style is really beautiful. So I hope you see what I meant here by uh, Morkborg's art sensibilities combined with more readable design. Uh, the art is a collage style where a lot of um, old public domains art is mashed together with other digital assets and things made to look strange and weird and surreal and beautiful. But a lot of the text is kept very clean and organized on the other side of the page. So this thing is much easier to read, at least for me, than Morkborg, and much easier to um, process those rules and bring it out on the table. So it is an odd world. The world is too large for explorers to map. You're an explorer. Citizens flock to Bastion. Uh, Bastion is the city that was uh, expanded recently in Electric Bastion Land. And a lot of times you're exploring the underground, this network of weird tunnels and spaces beneath the world. What do you do if you're new to RPGs? I love the collage style mix of old art and new stuff. It really gives the tone that Into the Odd has been famous for, even back in its original edition. Um, Into the Odd has always used a lot of public domain art, and this is a really nice twist on that. Uh, so if you've never played Into the Odd before, the system is you're doing 3d6 in order for three different special abilities, strength, dexterity, and willpower, and it's a roll under system. So you're going to be rolling a d20 underneath one of your ability scores to do most things. You have starter packages, which is really nice. So basically what you do is when you make a new character, you look at this chart and your hit points can go from one to six. So you'd look at the top, there's your hit points. And on the side, you look at the, your uh, highest ability score. And then by coordinating those two, you find out your starting package. So for example, if you start off with three hit points and your highest ability score is 16, then you start out with a hatchet, a net, some fire oil, and a burnt face. Really simple and straightforward. You can jump into the game really fast. Uh, generally, if you have really bad ability scores and low hit points, you tend to get better stuff. And if you have great hit points and high ability scores, your stuff doesn't tend to be as good, but it's not uh, exact. You never know quite what you're gonna get. Some really great stuff might be if you have like a low ability score, you could get a musket, a hatchet, a hawk, and an arcanum, or an arcanum, which is like a powerful magical item. Whereas a really good starting character might get bad equipment, like they get a mace, a pigeon, and they're disfigured. And that's all they get and just got to deal with it. The goal here is speed. Uh, some general notes on equipment. Uh, we'll get into the rules for combat a little bit later, but one of the main features of Into the Odd is that there's no two hit rolls. If you attack someone, you just deal damage immediately to them. It just cuts out one of those steps. 
Um, so like a noble weapon does D8 damage, just D8, D8, D8 every time you hit someone. Playing the game. So the rules of the Into the Odd famously fit on one page back in this additional in this original book. Um, it's, it's expanded a little bit here. I think just um, to have a little bit of white space so it can breathe a bit, but it's very easy to learn, very easy to pick up and teach. So saves are mostly how you do stuff. If you're rolling under, attacks are automatic. You got blast rules. You can do damage to a bunch of people at once. Critical damage. So once your hit points run out, then instead of dying immediately, excess damage rolls over into hitting your strength score. And every time that happens, you have to make a strength save to see if you pass out or not. So as your strength gets worn down more and more, you're more and more likely to pass out. There's kind of a grit and flesh divide here where your hit points recover very quickly, um, but your strength is going to recover much more slowly. Um, you can hit the rules for losing um, ability scores because those are going to go down over time. Uh, deprived, someone is deprived of a crucial need like food, water, warmth. They cannot benefit from rest. You're not going to get your hit points back. The rules in this are very similar to the original edition of Into the Odd. There's been very few changes. Uh, I think Chris said he made a couple of tweaks of things, of rules that brought over from Electric Bastion Land, but by and large, things are the same. Even that uh, third ability score is still called Willpower, uh, whereas it was changed to Charisma in Electric Bastion Land, which was the, the sequel to this. Um, Arcana. So you can start with Arcana at character creation, if you're lucky. And if that happens, you can just roll on this character sheet and see what you get. So there is, it's, uh, it's a D66, so that's, um, you're rolling two D6s using one of them as a tens die and one as a ones die. That means that there's 36 possible options, which is an expanded number from the original edition, which only had 20, I believe. And some of these have been tweaked a little bit. Uh, he said in order to make them a little bit more in line with his philosophy for how magic items should work. Let's look at a couple examples here. You could have a winter's sickle. Anybody taking damage from the sickle is deprived and feels cold to their bones until they spend at least an hour warming themselves by a fire. Or a fool's coin. Anybody that values money will crave this coin the first time they see it. The effect wears off after an hour. So there's very little game mechanics associated with most of these arcana. They just do concrete in-world things that a smart player can use to their advantage if you play your cards right. Uh, there's more powerful arcana that you can get, greater ones and legendary ones. I believe there's about 20 of each of those. So a legendary one might be something on the scale of uh, a star beam panel. As long as you have line of sight to the sky, you can call down a column of light for D20 damage. So you can just blast people from heaven. Or what's another one here? Uh, Dead Oak creates a permanent one mile zone where any living things lose 1D6 strength each hour starting at the end of this hour. Living things within this zone are instantly aware of this and try to leave. Even plants wither and die. So you can just like destroy an area. What's one more space cube? You can teleport things. Uh, rebirth coffin, a corpse is miraculously restored to life. One thing that I like that he recommends is that um, these arcana don't necessarily have to be small items that you can carry around. They could be much more large, um, bulky or clumsy items that you have to think about how you're going to transport them. It has an example of play, which is really great. Uh, most games should include examples of play, especially if your rules are a little bit odd, like we see in Into the Odd, uh, just because you really quickly get a sense of how the rules work. Into the Odd is designed for very high speed play. You make characters fast, you play fast. It's designed to get to the point as quickly as possible without a lot of faffing around with rules and subsystems. Things are pretty intuitive. And even if you get into combat, like I said, there's no attack roll, so you're just doing damage you know, really quickly both sides are and you quickly get to that point where characters have to decide do i want to stay and fight or do i want to leave right that's usually the interesting decision point in a combat and this just gets there quicker after the expedition so we have experience levels this doesn't use experience points per se instead it does stuff like um it has in-world requirements for gaining levels which can give you another d6 of uh, hit points and can possibly increase some of your ability scores by one. So for example, to become a professional, you have to survive at least one expedition. To be an expert, you survive at least three dangerous expeditions since reaching professional. If you want to be a master, you have an apprentice of at least expert level and have survived a dangerous expedition with them since reaching veteran level. So there's in-world qualifications here. So things are a little bit less abstract. Enterprise and war, you can start your own little business. 
You can um, form little uh, mini armies, little gangs, and there's rules for how to deal with that. Uh, you want to have ships and structures, and we start getting to refereeing. Uh, Chris McDowell is famous for his very high quality refereeing or GM advice uh, that's very easy to remember and often makes a big difference. We have his mantra right here, give information, present choices, and show consequences. It's the main job of a game master. You don't want to hide information from players. You want to make sure that they know what's going on around them so they can make choices. Then you want them to actually make those choices. And then once they make those choices, you want to have a strong consequence, either good or bad, so they can see that they are having a real impact on the game. Uh, luck rolls, how to deal with damage, uh, treasure and riches. Um, so you have your basic copper pennies, guilders, banknotes. Everything is on a one one hundredth scale, very much like in Dungeons and Dragons. Obstacles, tricks, and hazards. So um, his rules on how to deal with um, traps was very influential on me as well. I, think I made a whole video about this on dealing with traps. A lot of it came from Chris, where the idea here is not to hide traps as much. You put them right out there in the open because what you want are problems for players to solve. And players can't solve a problem if they don't know that it's there. Players are much more engaged when they see something weird or dangerous and have to figure out a way to disable it or bypass it and things like that. A whole bunch of sample hazards, like a balancing ledge, some swinging blades, and how to make that interesting for players to disable. Uh, different types of, or how to deal with different kinds of encounters. Monsters should have a drive. They should be have something that they're working towards. So you can actually run them like a creature with motivations and not just, they're all mindless killing machines. We have some example monsters here. I believe Chris said this is going to be fleshed out a little bit more. Perhaps there's going to be more images in here. Not really sure. Um, but we have just a lot of interesting monsters that uh, aren't just damage dealers. They make the combat different enough that players have to think about how they're fighting. So let's read one of these for example. Uh, let's look at the first one. We've got a dust hag. It's driven to protect itself and manipulate others. It attacks with claws, able to turn to dust at will. That's a big thing you'll have to deal with. Physical attacks are impaired and water-based attacks are enhanced. Uh, conjures a veil of dust around her when in danger, momentarily blinding all who fail a deck save. So finding ways to deal with a, a creature that can turn into dust, like maybe finding goggles that you can wear, would make, give you a, a big advantage in a fight like that. Dust staff, uh, gray dust starts to envelop the target. At the start of their turn, they must pass a will save or lose D6 will. It's repeated each turn until the target passes their save. And another ability, the eye, each floating eye that you can, a floating eye that you can direct and see through, destroying the eye causes the wielder of the eye to lose D6 will. So you have two different special items here that the dust hag has originally, but I'm sure you can take off their body. Kind of like a little mini arcana. In Odd Worlds, we get into the setting here. Bastion is the hub of mankind. You have the underground. Beyond Bastion is a deep country where things get increasingly weird the further out that you go. Golden Lands and the Polar Ocean. And we get into the introductory adventure, the Iron Coral. Um, this is a dungeon, and there is a hex crawl that's attached to it that we'll look at. Originally, in the first book, this was just a one-level dungeon. Um, but this has now been expanded to be, I think, three or more levels. Uh, so there's a lot more space to explore, a lot more weirdness to encounter. Uh, we have our map over here on the left. It's pretty readable. Again, it's done in a collage style. Uh, it's not too bad. It's a little jumbly, a little hard for me to read immediately, but it's really not too bad. Um, the design of the, um, the text for showing what's in each room, though, is really well done. Um, even back in Morkborg, I praised the dungeon design capabilities of Johan Noor in terms of the layout, and there's no exception here. One thing I love especially is look at the rooms, how they're all done in this bullet point format. But next, instead of a bullet point, a lot of times that there's an arrow instead, which indicates a possible exit to the room, right? So number one is the pit. And it says dark cave with echoing waves. That's in bold. It pops out. Easy to read. You see that immediately. You can communicate that to your players. Echo sounds metallic. And there's an arrow to the right. Crawlway. Damp. Leads to five. If you look at the map over there, the crawlway is literally a direction to the right. You have a foam-filled passageway. Arrow pointing down. And there's a uh, room right below it that's filled with foam. So just by looking at those arrows, you know the ways out that players can go. Great. I love that. It's a very smart way to uh, do that design. 
if you ever have a monster, it's written in a different color, right? It has this blue um, typeface over here, which matches the blue of the monster sample monsters that we saw earlier. We have a uh, level two, an underground breach, a marbling of the twisted familiarity of the underground and the living ocean itself. One thing that would have been nice is mini maps, because if you're running um, the, this level, you're going to have to be flipping back and forth between this page, looking at the map, and then over here to look at the uh, room description. It's not that big of a deal. Would have been nice to have mini maps, though, just to avoid that. But there's space constraints, so you can't do everything always. Let's look at some of these rooms here. We have a, uh, a mutation chamber. It's, class, it's a glass chamber, lever inside, lightning bolt, um, which I guess maybe is something to look at in particular. Um, pulling the level shrouds occupant with gas, causing immediate mutation, changing a random ability score to D20, and giving an appropriate visual change, needing 24 hours to recharge. The different corridors going in different directions. So I, I would guess the lightning bolt symbol represents um, things that can happen there to look out for. Level three, halls of glass and gold, a place of luxury and fragility. Let's pick a random room here. We have uh, the dream room, walls, black tiles, soft, almost velvety texture. That's great. That's involving other senses besides just sight. Silver framed beds, impossibly comfortable. You can fall asleep at will in each dream about the contents of a random room on this floor. Roll d20. Waking up a few seconds later, fully refreshed and benefiting from a full rest. This only works once per day. And then you got a stairway up. The Fallen Marsh, so this is the hex crawl that is attached to the iron coral. You can see on the hex crawl here, iron coral is this uh, pink hex that's over on the left side. We got rules for traveling, rules for weather, and uh, some landmarks. Each hex contains a random encounter. Got a whole bunch of those right there, including some monsters done with uh, abbreviated stat blocks. The nice thing about Into the Odd is that both characters and NPCs and monsters can be written in very tight, easy to read stat blocks which prevents you from having to do a whole lot of work for that. I like how each of these pages does have that hex map reproduced, which is what I meant by mini maps. That's great. So prevents you from having to flip around. Uh, let's look at a, a random hex here. We have a hoarding cave, insects on walls, large furry centipedes, harmless, a pile of broken furniture, tattered clothes, skeletal corpses, a set of silver cutlery worth one, uh, gilder and bricks. I like how the bold stuff is stuff that players would see automatically, so you know what to describe for them, whereas the italic stuff is things that you would not necessarily know unless you got up close and examined. So there's kind of like a fractal description right here, where depending on the stance the players are in, you know what to describe to them. And it says there's also a four in six chance it is being guarded by a pair of ape men. They defend their horde but flee when badly hurt. They continue to harass anyone that steals from them. Harassing monsters are really nice um, because... When players see monsters, they expect monsters to just stand in front of them and fight them. But when players are on a journey, monsters that are just like following them from a distance and won't let the players get close and then bother them constantly is way more irritating. And it's good to irritate players in that way because it gets them to think about how they're going to deal with this. Hero's Tomb, so one of the hexes has a little mini dungeon that you can also find and explore. You got a burning tower green caves, overgrown shrine. So it's not just one dungeon. You got a bunch of little places you can explore, including an actual city, Hope's End, the last port of the north, which has a number of places in it, like Paradiso Park, the Pickled Goose Tavern and Boardhouse, the Docks, Black Flamingo Trade House. We have random happenings and rumors, like, for example, a huge wave washed over the town, leading to greater rumors of the Sea Witch returning. Bunch of people, each of which is described in very concrete and memorable terms. So Joy, Body Landlady. We've got their stats. Uh, stocky and red-faced, driven to keep her tavern bustling and noisy. Hates being alone, since she believed she was abducted by glowing creatures. Only goes into detail when drunk. That's perfect. That's all you need to know. Lots of good interactivity. You can Im immediately uh, visualize it, and you can immediately run it if you're a game master. At the back, we have an odd pendium. I really love this. This was also in the original book. I think it might be expanded a bit here. Um, but it just gives you tons of random tables for generating stuff that you might need. This was another big inspiration for me when I was writing Maze Rats. So Bastion's Cast of Thousands. If you go to uh, Bastion, the main city, 
in the region, or really you could use this anywhere in the setting. You can just create NPCs really quickly by rolling uh, a D100. Although there's usually, let's see, about 33, I think, um, people per page. Well, let's uh, create a character really quickly here. You could have uh, Junus is his forename. Surname is Tareen, Junus Tareen. Occupation is a actor. Capability is uh, trapped in the job. Maybe he doesn't like being an actor, he wants to get out, but the acting guild will not let him leave. Adventure hook. What's his manner? Um, he is a greasy toad. His connection, um, former colleagues with, make another NPC and now you have two people connected together. What happened to this person? Uh, murdered in the street or saw, saw weird things in the sky. You need a little backstory for them. Traveling around a street, what's the street like? It's a shop row, the atmosphere is rat infested. Is there a link here to the underground? Lots of different links to the underground, so it's not always just a hole in the ground. A wine cellar, perhaps, or an open sewer, or a, a tunnel at the bottom of the river. Quickest route, route across town, Bastion's greatest business businesses. These are always combinations of two different businesses, which I like. Uh, confectioners, village uh, foods and homes. Black horse hospitals and asylums. Uh, one of Chris's great ideas is that you take two different things, whether that's designing a business or most other features in an RPG, things that aren't necessarily connected and you mash them together and you make them work together. And that conflict generates interest and it generates problems to solve. Weird creature inspirations and make monsters really fast. What's the nature of the monster? It's sapient and armored. Its form is a cube, a sapient armored cube. That's terrifying. But the twist is that it fires bullets. Uh oh. Uh, astral cults. You want to make some of those? What's beyond the darkness? What's that island? I eat the stuff. Is this thing an arcanum? Um, alternative character groups. You want to make some of those? You want to get some mutations? Mutations are always happening when you're delving down underneath Bastion. It is a weird place. Some simple folk, trinkets, unhumans, and an index at the back of the book. I guess the index looks like it's not finished yet. I'm sure we'll just put that in there once the book is fully finished. So that is my flip through of Into the Odd Remastered. It is everything that I liked about Into the Odd, but expanded with uh, even nicer layout and beautiful art. I'm really into it. Uh, as I mentioned before, the link is right down there in the description. I would check that out for yourself and see if you want to pick it up. Last time I checked, the Kickstarter is doing very well, so it's almost certainly going to be published. And uh, once it is, I'll make sure to update that link so you can get it for yourself. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next time.